Hello and welcome to another video from the conscientious biologist Ben Gallagher. This video is the first in a sequence of three on transport through membranes. It covers diffusion and active transport. You don't need to have specifically watched anything before this, though it's useful to have watched the surface area to volume ratio presentation and ideally the cell biology lessons, but this one does function as a standalone unit. As always, if you enjoy these lessons, if you learn from them, please do subscribe to my channel. You'll see a link at the end of this video. Thanks. So we're going to start this biology by not specifically looking at the topic. We're going to look at a basic anal analogy to get the concept across to you. If you've never come across this word analogy before, an analogy is a story that has the same kind of meaning. And if you can understand this analogy, then diffusion is going to be really, really easy. So let's say I was in a room and in walked a person. Let's call him Robbie. Lots of people know a Robbie. And Robbie comes in and I say, Robbie, go and stand in the corner over there. You've got to stay in that corner. You've got to stand in that corner over there. Robbie might not be none too happy about it, but if he does as he's told, he'll go and stand in that corner. Now, if another 14 people come into the room and as they all come in, I tell all of them, go and stand over there with Robbie, please. I want all of you to cram yourselves into that corner, get really squashed in there. And then I leave them there. They're not going to feel very happy about that. Most people don't like being crammed in, especially they're with strangers, people they don't know. They're not going to want to be in that situation. So imagine what would happen next if I removed the parameters instead of me saying, right, you've got to stay there. If I remove that and said, OK, you don't have to stay there anymore. You can do what you like. The obvious thing that they would do is they're going to spread out into the room. OK, so they're going to spread out. They're going to take up some more space. They don't want to be crammed in next to each other. They're almost repelled by the people around them. So they push themselves out into space. Now, look at the guy still over there. Let's still call him Robbie. Robbie is still in the corner. He hasn't really moved very far. But there's a very key reason for that, because everyone else spread themselves out into the room. If Robbie was one of the last ones to move because he was the first one in the corner, by the time he's ready to move, he can kind of go, oh, well, there's space here now, actually. No one's cramming me, so I don't need to move very far. So Robbie might kind of stay where he is. He's most successful on his own there. But if we look at this second group here that I mark in a circle, they moved out from the corner, but they've still found themselves in a little bit of a tight huddle. Now, let's call them, for example, Howard, Mark and Gary. Howard, Mark and Gary are still stood in a tight little unit. They don't like being closely there together. If we look at the guy way over in the top corner over there, let's call him Jason. Jason's quite happy on his own. He's never really been big into being crushed into a group anyway. So he's fine over there. But those three, they're still bunched very tightly together. They don't want to be bunched tightly together. So think logically what's going to happen next. They're going to spread out. They're going to take up some space that wasn't previously occupied. But now look what's happened. There's a big void that's been left behind. There's a big space there in the middle where they were that nobody is now. So try and think logically about what the next thing is that's going to happen. People around who are bunched together still might move back into that space. But of course, by them moving into that space, it may create space for somewhere else that someone can move into because they want to be in that space. That may have left a void somewhere else so someone can move into that space. The point I'm trying to make is that all of these people will constantly be moving in a very dynamic way, constantly shifting from if they're bunched up to someone else, they're going to spread out. They're going to spot a bit of space and go, I'm going to get into that space. But if someone gets there at the same time, they'll go, oh, there's a bit of space over there and they'll move and they'll constantly be moving to try and spread out and get themselves into some space. So let's start to link that analogy up and start to put some definitions here. So that analogy really covered diffusion and diffusion is where particles instead of people move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So in the analogy, the people were at high concentration in the corner. They didn't want to be. So they spread out into the low concentration. There were no people in the room. So low concentration of people in the room. They spread out from high to low. In other words, they spread out to find a bit of space. Now in biological systems, which are just cells, that's what we're talking about, particles will quite often cross through a membrane if there's more space on one side than the other side. If there's a high concentration outside the cell, they might move through the membrane to get to the low concentration inside the cell. 
So let's really focus now on diffusion and cells and put what I've just said into a diagram here for you. So if I've got a cell and if I put a load of particles outside the cell, you can see that outside the cell they are at a high concentration. Inside the cell in the cytoplasm they are at a low concentration. So it should be very, very obvious to you that they're going to move from outside the cell to inside the cell because that's how they can spread out best. Now that's what generally happens in cells and one example of this diagram is in your small intestine. You've eaten your food, you've eaten your nutrients, you've digested them and broken them down to amino acids, glucose, lipids, all the other little nutrients that you've got. Those nutrients are in your small intestine at high concentration, so they're going to move by diffusion into the cells of the small intestine, where there was a lower concentration, and then from there on into the blood to be sent around your body. So let's now develop that concept and add in this idea of the rate of diffusion. Now rate is just another name for speed. So when we're talking about the rate of diffusion, we're looking at the speed at which particles move from their area of high concentration to their area of low concentration. So if you look at the diagram I've got at the side of me there, I've put 11 blocks in a stack. That's to represent 11 particles. Next to it, I've just got one block, so that's representing one particle. So you can see there that I've got a high and I've got a low. Now by diffusion, by what we've just learned, particles should move from the high to the low. So that arrow is representing the direction that they should want to move. Those particles don't want to be in a big stack, in a big concentration. They're going to move across. So let's think about how quickly they'll move across. If I add a little slope there, you can see that that slope is pretty steep because the high is very high. It's 11 blocks high. The low is very low. It's only one block high. So we've got a difference of 10. That's a big difference. So when we're thinking about the speed at which that yellow arrow is going to represent, the speed at which things will move, there's something really easy you can do to imagine how fast it will go. Just imagine someone on a bike sat on that gradient, sat on that slope. Because it's very, very sleep, uh, steep, that cyclist is going to move very, very quickly down that slope because it's a steep gradient. Now, if we remove that, and if we imagine some of the blocks have already diffused across, so we'll take three off the high stack and put them onto the low stack. So some diffusion has taken place now. We've gone from the high to the low, and because they've moved, the high isn't as high as it was, and the low isn't as low as it was. If I put the gradient back on there now with our cyclist, you can see it's a much shallower gradient. So think about the speed of that cyclist going down that hill. He's not going to be going as fast as he was when he was on that really, really steep gradient. So the factor that affects the rate of diffusion is the concentration gradient. So we can now adapt that first sentence to a more full explanation that the speed at which particles move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration depends on the concentration gradient. Gradient is the steepness, concentration gradient just means the difference between the concentrations. At the start it was big and then it got less, okay? The bigger the difference, the faster the particles will spread out. Now let's just develop that a little bit further now. And let's say that um, if we remove some more of the high, and put them on the low. So more has diffused across now. It will have diffused across more slowly because the gradient was lower, but it's now diffused across. Look at what's happened to my high and my low. One's not high, one's not low anymore. I don't have a concentration difference. So if I put my gradient line back on there, it's totally flat. If my cyclist was on there, You'd be forgiven for thinking he'd just stay still. There's no downhill momentum now to move him. Now that's not quite accurate. That's not exactly what happens. Because actually when it's flat, when neither is high, and neither is low, diffusion can still occur in that direction, but it will still just as rapidly occur back in the other direction and back in the other direction again. And diffusion will just occur in both directions but there'll be no net gain on either side. The same amount will go that way as go back that way. They'll just be steadily moving back and forth. Just like in our first analogy of those people walking around dynamically, suddenly it might change slightly, they might be slightly higher, so they'll move that way, and then it might switch and they'll move back and forth. But it's constant, there's no net increase 
on either side. That's when we say the system is at equilibrium. Both sides are equal. Uh, let's just fade some of that out and get it back just to the blocks. And then we'll look at what can happen if you still want to move things in that same direction. So we've just said if they're equal, there's going to be equal movement in both directions. But if by diffusion, some of them from that pile moved across, then of course, by diffusion, some of them would move back because we've just established a high and a low, but in the reverse direction. So you would expect the two that had moved across to diffuse back. But what if we don't want things to move back in that direction? What if we just want to keep them going in the original direction that we wanted? That means we've now got to go from a low to a high. So again, think about it in terms of the gradient. The gradient now goes uphill. So if we want to move things in that other direction, we've got to go against the concentration gradient. And you think if that was you cycling on that hill, you can't just freewheel easily with no energy being put in by yourself. You're going to have to put energy in to get up the hill, to get up the concentration gradient. So if things want to move, if particles want to move from a low concentration to a high concentration, they've got to put the effort in, they've got to put the energy in. So it's an active process because anything that requires energy is an active process. If it doesn't require energy, it's a passive process. Passive doesn't require energy, active does require energy. Now what we've just explained here is our second concept. This is active transport, different to diffusion because it's now moving from a low to a high and it requires energy. But this is still commonly used in the body if you want to take things in, but you can't rely on diffusion. Or maybe there was um, a high and a low. They reached equilibrium, but you still wanted to keep going. So once you're beyond 50 percent, 50 50, you've got to use active transport to get the rest of it in. So active transport is how you get against a concentration gradient. But to do that, uh, sorry, I should add, if you're going to do that, um, then what you're moving by active transport must be more than what's moving out the other way by diffusion. Think, if you're moving things that way in the direction they don't want to go, they're going to be trying to come back. Now, if you're only moving them at the same speed that they're coming back, everything's going to stay imbalanced. So if you're going to have any kind of net gain, your active transport needs to be more than your diffusion. So you'll see I've put two arrows there for active transport to diffusion. If you can actively transport two for every one that's coming back by diffusion, then your pile on the side you want is going to get bigger and bigger. Really nice, simple analogy I can give you for that one. Just imagine a sinking ship that someone's trying to bail out quickly. Water's going to be moving into the boat through a hole. That's basically your diffusion. You need to bail the water out to stop the ship from sinking and ideally empty the water out. Now, if you bail at the same speed that the water's coming in, the water in the boat will stay the same. If you can bail faster than the water's coming in, then you're going to reduce the level of water in the boat, get it back into the ocean. You're going to have shifted it out, pumped it out faster. OK, so the man bailing, that's like active transport. It's going to be really active doing that. Diffusion is like the water coming in, trying to sink your ship. So that's a nice analogy for active transport. But because it's difficult in the picture there, you've got a man bailing the stuff out. It's not a man bailing stuff out, though. It's that if cells are going to move things through their membrane by active transport, they must have special protein pumps in their membranes. So proteins, you might remember from other lessons, proteins do everything in cell systems. You've got to have a special protein that's literally grabbing the stuff and throwing it through the membrane against the concentration gradient. And that pump's got to work faster than diffusion going in the other direction. Otherwise, you'll never get the increase that you want. So let's do a nice little overview of the key points here just to summarize it all and give you something you can take a screenshot of. So for both diffusion and active transport, let's look at diffusion first. It's the passive, meaning it doesn't require energy. We used that term a minute ago. Net movement, net because net takes into account what comes back. So if I move three through by diffusion, but one diffused back, the overall change is two. That's the net change. The gross is that we sent out three. But because one came back, the net, the overall, was a change of two. 
So it's the passive net movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's the basic definition for diffusion. As we've just said about this net change, some particles may, may diffuse back, but more will move from high to low than will come back from low to high. Therefore, diffusion is net overall movement from a high to a low concentration. Net diffusion will continue until equilibrium is reached. So remember, that's where we have the high and the low. But as things move, the high gets lower and the low gets higher until they're equal. That is equilibrium. At that point, diffusion is equal in both directions. If you still want to shift things across, that's where you need active transport. Particles must be able to move. You've got to have free movement of particles for diffusion to occur. So it can only occur in liquids and gases. Remember in solids, the particles are really tightly jammed together and their bonds are in place so they can't move. If they can't move, they can't diffuse. So you'll only get diffusion in liquids and gases. And lastly, put simply, diffusion is just particles spreading out into space. Let's look at active transport. Uh, it's the active move movement, active because it requires energy. That's a key thing. Uh, from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So it's the reverse. It's going against the concentration gradient. Uh, and as we've already said, it's active because it requires energy. It also requires that protein in the membrane, but that's a bit of more A-level knowledge that's less important for GCSE. As I said, this is a great slide to take a screenshot of. It covers almost everything that we've talked about in this lesson. So as I said at the start, this is only the first of three videos on transport through membranes. So please follow on from this one and build up your knowledge by watching the transport through membranes to osmosis presentation. That one looks at the concept of osmosis. And then the third presentation builds on that by looking at examples of osmosis in biological system. That third one's really, really important because it puts a lot of your plant biology in there and a lot of cell specializations. So this unit as a whole is a very comprehensive cover of transport through membranes, but it does link into several other topics as well. So please do make sure you watch all three videos in this series. As always, if you've enjoyed this, you've learned from what we've talked about, you like the style of these videos, please do go to the channel page and subscribe and like this video if it's good so I know what kind of stuff I need to keep making. Thanks a lot.